The purpose and hope of Soul of a Citizen today is to gather together civic and faith leaders in our dominant culture of society and, and how we have separation of church and state and how it's difficult to talk about religion and politics at the Thanksgiving table. How can we come together as faith leaders and civic leaders utilizing the best resources that we have available to us and make a greater community, uh, striving toward the greater good and the common good. That's the, the conversations that we're having today, that we're starting today. We have a history in San Antonio that goes back to like probably long before the Civil Rights Movement. But even during the Civil Rights Movement, there weren't riots in San Antonio because there are faith leaders and community leaders who said, that's not happening here. We have a history of, you know, when gangs and gang violence was at its highest peak, that we brought leadership together across faith lines and across civic lines to do something different. And so we start again today at Soul of a Citizen and asking those questions, can, can faith relations be a civic practice and can civic relations be a faith practice? Coming from an environment where our religion or spiritual growth has always been very, very important, I think um, in looking at it and still serving in a public office, I think my conclusion about behavior in, in that realm is that religion is a, can be a set of rituals that speak from a certain dedication of values, right? And um, so I feel like what I need to bring into public office is that set of values. I don't need to bring in um, a set of rituals. I don't need to um, bring in diehard, um, you know, regulations and diehard beliefs, uh, but to bring those values. Um, I remember the first time when I was all shocked and upset that uh, when I was running for office and somebody just lied about things, and I was just, I was kind of entertained and amazed. And, uh, and then my friends were saying, oh, well, Patty, that's politics. And I said, no, that's lying. <laughs> and, um, you know, and, I, and, and so it disturbs me every time somebody does something ugly, something bad in politics, and people say that's politics. No, it's supposed to be about doing, uh, making good decisions, right, for, for people's lives, for society's life. So we have to stop identifying lying and cheating and stealing with politics. But I just start off there that um, I, I think that it's, it's the values that we have to intermingle. Why would we leave behind? Why would we enter um, civic engagement? Why would we enter a public office and leave behind a commitment to honesty, a commitment to love, a commitment to understanding? I guess when, when, when you said that, I had one particular question when you found yourself at this place and you said, no, this person is lying. Sometimes, and we've seen it in public discourse where people are speaking out out of anger, and sometimes out of anger comes a fear. And so part of it is sometimes, although it takes time to enter into dialogue, is how do we find moments where we can approach those who are coming at us, right? To say, what is it that you fear the most? What, what is it that causes you to behave in this manner? I remember specifically one time going to a public forum when the city was considering expanding uh, our, nucle our, our nuclear energy plants. And um, I was at a town hall meeting and I had questions about process that I went up and asked those sitting up CPS and all those. Because I had questions and concerns. It was after everything had happened in Japan and I was sincerely concerned. I had questions about how we were going to take care of the waste. And I remember walking towards the back and this gentleman approached me, just attacked me, you know, verbally and everything. And I had to stop and say, what is it that I said? that angered you so much. And he didn't know how to answer that. 
But until I think we can start to engage in some kind of dialogue about what is it? Is it the fear? And what is that fear? Because that's where it stems from. And that's how we start to begin to have a conversation to move forward, I think, in a productive manner. That's one thought I have. Well, I'll, I'll say, judging by the fact that everybody raised their hands when asked if, if they're a person of faith, tells me that we, the answer has to be yes. We just have to figure out how to get there. And I think for me, it's very helpful to think about the differences between politics and civics, which is kind of a, you're distinguishing between the two because, you know, I, I bristle. In fact, when I was campaigning, one of the first things I would tell people is I'm not a politician. I'm here to be a public servant. And I think there's a difference there for people that we have to be clear about. The other part is that I think faith is a deeply personal thing. And there is a dis there's a difference between faith and organized religion in the same sort of way. Um, I think about politics as a way of separating people at the camps. Civics is a way of bringing us all together under a cause, under a, you know, a, a community. Same way that faith as a deeply personal thing, your connection with your creator is, is, is a, something that's different for me than going to church on Sunday. Uh, you know, I think that if we understand that what we're civics, if we're going to make it work, is about bringing more people into the tent, figuring out how we can more in, involve more people uh, and figure out how we can get to where we want to go as a community as opposed to individual camps of people, um, I think that's a, for me, that's a step uh, towards the answer. <coughs> I would start to, uh, to mention something that and she said, the, in, the institute called Inter, Institute of Interfaith Dialogue, but we changed the name to Dialogue Institute. There's a basic reason behind that. When you say the Interfaith, you put a particular group of people in one uh, side, and there's question, is there another person that not faith person? But what's going to happen if it's a city and we need the engagement of all citizens? Then it needs to be a common name that welcome everyone. Interfaith, maybe it's not a problem for San Antonio, but probably for some part of other world. And when you change the name from Interfaith to the dialogue, some people, they welcome you because well, it, it might come from their background, from their environment that they didn't raise in a faith uh, family or they don't believe that it works. But honestly, everyone has a value. Either you have humanitarian, international value that you believe and you shape your life, or you have faith value that you shape your life. And when it comes to our city or to our life, we need to look which value is shaping our life. If it's our city, let's look at it. Do, do we have a theology for our city? The, the way that we build our uh, buildings, the way that we uh, build our neighborhoods. What's leading us? Our faith, our humanitarian value, or the political legend that is behind of our mind? Uh, there is a common belief for the politicians in all around the world. It's a question mark. And Honestly, if they have a value, either the faith value or the international value, the humanitarian value, then it comes to, as Councilman, he mentioned, it comes not to be a politician, it comes to be a civic servant for the city. All good points. And uh, Patty, I'd say to you that, you know, I respect you very much, but uh, politics doesn't have the corner on the market on lying. It goes on other places. And uh, goes on business and and uh, neighborhoods and and all that. And uh, in my business career, I I've, I've felt like that. And I like what you said about values. It's not about wearing your religion on your sleeve, but it it, it some, sometimes it is. But it's about having, like the councilman said, you know, it's a deeply personal belief that has an effect on the way you live and work. And, um, and what I've found is people in, in the business world that have that deep personal fundamental value system 
whether you know their religion is something I understand or not. They have more balance in their life, I think. And so I, I think about that with civic engagement. If there if there was more of that, we'd have more balance in our civic uh, engagement in our in our city. And I'm just excited to go to work for an organization that is faith based. I don't think it's worn in the sleeve all the time, but I've talked to one employee there that who was in very organized religion, and that person has told me this has been the most satisfying part of my career, and that's helping people. That and, and it, I think it's deeply seated in that value system of, of faith. I'd like to add on to this the theme of the personal and how difficult it is to enter into dialogue because it is so personal. The aspect of faith, how it relates to our identity. For me, I grew up sick in San Antonio and I remember shying away always and going to great lengths to avoid being in conversation with people where I would reveal that and or or feeling shameful or embarrassed of friends meeting my parents and seeing that my dad wore a turban and that was actually before 9-11. Then after 9-11 it radically changed the way that my family practiced our faith. My dad removed his turban and cut his hair and shaved his beard and very um, an experience that many folks who wear turbans in the United States experienced after 9-11. So just to drive home the point of how personal it is, I think this aspect of our identity can bring us joy and it can also bring us pain. And that's what makes it so hard to talk about. For me, it wasn't until I went to college and my critical consciousness formed and I started to understand how identities affect our lived experiences that I then was able to take control of that, that part of my identity, be proud of it and celebrate it and even go as far as then to say, what responsibility does my faith give me? What values does my faith tell me that what, how I can contribute to having an inclusive community? Um, not only for people of the Sikh faith and tradition, but other religious communities, other identities that experience discrimination or biases or prejudices. And that's then how it informs um, or how it defines my public service. I appreciate being in the room with such a distinguished group of people. I know a lot of you through the years have done a great deal to work on interfaith yourselves. I would stand right by Patty, which she so eloquently expressed about separation of church and state. I think it's separated for a reason to give strength to each. My concern is that there are people of faith, and I'm not sure a lot of them are in this room, who feel squelched that they can't speak about it in the public square. And I think we're gonna to have to figure out how to talk to them to bring everybody in so people feel safe, but we can protect separation of church and state. And thank you, Nelson, for, for joining us. And <laughs> But we've just basically been responding to the question that Anne put before us regarding the integration of, you know, politics and uh, church and civic service, religion. If you'd like to make any comment, Ed. Uh, well, first of all, I think it's extremely important it's done in the right way. I don't like anybody taking their faith and telling me that it has to be that way and no other way. And we see that in the political spectrum today, whether it's Ted Cruz or whether it's Trump or whoever. You know, it's great to have a faith, great to expose your own, but not make everybody feel uncomfortable if they don't agree with the faith that you have. We all have faith in some way because we can spend some faith, but we all are different. I'm certainly different. But I think it's extremely important to have that working condition. I'll give you two or three examples. Uh, when I was mayor, the city was exploding with violence. The highest murder rate ever in the early 1990s. Gang shootings. 
but it was the faith community that came together that created a atmosphere of taking young people and giving them other choices to do. And I worked with every religious group there was in town to be able to do that. We shut down uh, clubs on the river that were strip clubs. Uh, uh, we opposed gambling coming to San Antonio. We did a lot of good things collectively together, political system and faith. Same thing, I guess you've got to point to Cops Metro as a good example. Catholic base, but they're not telling me what I have to believe in in terms of my faith, but they're telling me what I need to believe in in terms of community. And I think that was great. I mean, we still have a great working uh, relationship after 25, 25 years or so. Uh, <clears throat> we're going to have a big conference in, uh, in the fall of this year led by faith or dealing with mental health issues and how can churches be more proactive in doing that. So the relationship and, and the coming together is very, very important if it's done in the right way. And I think most religious uh, groups do that in the right way. There's some candidates that um, I just don't like the idea of somebody completely telling me that I've got to believe in a certain way or that that's the way it's going to be and every other Christian's a bad person. I don't, I don't know that. And so on that, on that point, um, so with the dialogue, when we go back to dialogue, is, is certainly trying not to so much talk about our different faiths and the differences that exist, but how do we go about having conversations and dialogue about our shared interests in humanity? How do we address the needs of the most vulnerable in our communities um, and in include them, right? But how do we also um, really talk about what are the shared interests that we all have? Because I think collectively we all want a better San Antonio, a better, a stronger San Antonio, a San Antonio that brings people to the table. And so with that, our hope or the hope is that, um, that when we, we are sitting at the table, when we are convening groups and making decisions, that my hope is that we would talk about the changes that we wanna make for the common good, but also look at who's at the table making those decisions but most importantly, who is not. And I think that's very, very critical. Who is not at the table when we're looking to pass policies, when we're looking to pass laws, policies that are affecting, you know, different groups in our community. I think it's important to ask ourselves those questions. I'll, I'll respond to that, and you mentioned Cops Metro and Jorge's here, and uh, I've had a relationship with them. Uh, it's been very enjoyable for a long time, and uh, th there's faith at the heart of that. It's not just Catholics. I mean, there's some Methodists there, too, Jorge and others. And, and, uh, but I, I know that at the root of, you know, it's that value that is there, and it, they do just what you are saying, and they they are the voice for those who wouldn't otherwise have a voice. I think they're a very important component of our community. And, uh, you know, faith is in that somewhere. Can I should bring a really important issue to the table, the identity. Uh, the question is how you are going to describe yourself? How many identities do you have? Do you have just one identity that relates to your faith? Or do you have one identity that related to your nation, your color, and your beliefs, your culture? You have, each of us has many identities. And I guess the most important thing, which one is the dominant? In whatever you do for the community, if your faith is dominant, then you are going to act that way. If your race is, then you are going to discriminate some people because you, you cannot they bring a common ground for all of them. Now we have to make the distinction between our identities and either being a father or being a faith leader or being a politician. That doesn't matter. All have to have a balance and when you act as a 
public servant in a city, you don't have to a uh, right to make a distinction between, between the different paid people. We have different organizations like Happy for Hope or uh, Food Bank. They do an amazing job, but when you look at who they are serving, they don't look at the, 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 the race, the, the color, the faith. They serve to all people who are in need. And we, we have to be careful about our identity and which one is dominant. Yeah, the, the conversation about identity is fascinating, and I don't know where I heard this, but I was told that America is unique in the world with regard to how we express identity in terms of the hyphen. Um, you know, we have Mexican Americans, we have African Americans, we have Italian Americans, Jewish Americans, everything hyphenated American. And that's been the emphasis is on American. That's where we come together as a country. But you talk about the political dialogue that's happening now, certainly nationally, as an attempt to reverse that. You, know, you ask, what's the priority? Well, it's this first, country. But it's the emphasis on how do we create divisions among these Americans so that we know, you know who's really speaking for me. This, this uh, comment about, you know, this is, this is my religion. If you're, you're with me, uh, you're with me, you're with my religion. If you're not, then you're not even an American. And that's the part that I think is really destructive and that we really have to be wary of, especially in a local community like San Antonio, to keep that away because we have done, we've expressed that hyphen so very well in San Antonio in our history. I wanted to comment on something you said earlier, uh, Monica, uh, regarding, um, uh, you know, the fear and uh, having a reflex that says, what are you afraid of? I think that's an important reflex, you know, because the delivery of it would be, uh, you know, be cautious as well, but it's like getting to that root of what is it that's separating us, you know? And, and usually somewhere in there it's um, that we don't understand each other. Or, or there's an ignorance on my part about what your background is or how you came to the conclusion of what you're doing. Um, and um, getting to that, I think, is very important. And it, um, again, it affects where our common ground is. And, and if we don't ask that question, it gets in the way of us understanding our common ground. And perhaps we're operating out of the same value but seeing it in, in a different light. And if I can understand how it is that you're, you're seeing it, you know, maybe I can relay my fears of whatever it is. But, um, and I think you're also your, your statement about who's at the table is very, very important. Um, I think of when I was in college and this uh, priest asked us, what does it mean to feed the hungry? And here we are very middle class students uh, living on campus in the dorms and one of them says well I think it means if, if somebody wants a second dessert we should get up and go get it for them and that didn't really sit with me I didn't think that's what Jesus was talking about it <clears throat> but uh, but there you know who was at the table it wasn't the people of poverty that were one block away you know uh, and when we're making decisions in the city thank God that cops is there um, and yet there's so many people who aren't, you know, that, uh, and are you, do you bring to the table in, in, in politics or civic engagement that idea of inclusiveness? If that's one of your values to be inclusive, are you looking broad enough? And, and if you're in a, some kind of a cocoon like we were uh, on a college campus, uh, are you aware of that? Because, you know, people who live on the north side have no reason to drive down Elvira Street or Dorion and see the terrible conditions of that housing. But they may be people who operate out of very strong values about helping people who are, are poor, but if they, they don't see it, if it's out of their vision. You know, so how do we get ourselves to be conscious of asking questions related to inclusiveness when it comes to making political decisions? Um, and how do we bring those, again, those values that are at the root of perhaps why somebody ran for public office or why they're involved with their church. Um, you know, if we get, get to that value, we can, I think, unite on some of the actions.
it might actually be a good time to move and expand the conversation. Sounds like a natural pause. Patty? How about when it, uh, Judy was just oh, about I'm to sorry. say something? No, that's okay. She, I didn't see. I'm sorry. I, I was just going to add that my natural group started a civility institute. Uh, firstly, I think so that we Jews could learn how to speak to each other civilly, but also so that for our country. And I've been to several of their workshops, and there are actual tools that people can learn, and that's something that we could share to get people to learn to listen and talk to each other. A it perfect is, segue. It's just okay. a really strong word that uh, most of us, we have to learn, listen and learn. Just the basic, it's in our knowledge, but we don't use it, listen and learn. Well, let the other side speak what they want to say and respect what, what they say and then learn from them. I guess it's all. <laughs> Thank you, Mama. Um, so I think what we're going to do is expand the conversation because I also saw some folks who were like wanting to raise their hand and participate, which means they're ready, right? So um, what we're going to do for another half hour is that I'm going to invite the entire room to be in conversation and to turn to each other in groups of like three, no more than four, and I'm going to encourage you as leaders and as adults to maybe be in groups of people you've never met before, there's something. But we might be able to listen and learn things from people we don't know. You know, we like to, as humans, kind of stick with the folks that we know, and that's real affirming and comfortable. But uh, anyway, for about a half hour, to turn to other people and talk, Continue the conversation just as if because you were in the room. And I know Ali was over here. He was one of those raising his hand. So he's ready to talk, right? So we're going to do that for about 30 minutes. And um, we also want to invite those small groups. If you have a thought or a question, we're going to come and bring you some index cards. But a, a thought of conversation, a question of conversation that kind of comes out of your group, we'll collect those. And then we're going to come back again in a closing circle and we're going to kind of continue from those, if that makes sense. I do want to take a moment um, to recognize the architect because she's going to go to work, I hope. Look at her. Um, but this is my daughter, Rachel. And she helped create this beautiful room that you're in. And so I'm very proud of my legacy standing over there. So. Um, because she believes in San Antonio, and that's why she does restorative architecture. So, um, anyway, so I invite you to do that. You know, if you don't know where the restrooms are, because this might be something someone needs, they're out the door here and immediately to the left. And there's water and coffee and pastries still. But we're not really taking a break. We're turning to each other in threes or fours and continuing the conversation. All right? Are we clear? Great. If we can take a seat. We can take a seat. Our closing circle will again be uh, our convening circle. Um, again, what we're just trying to do here is to continue to model leadership. And so I'm relying on the, the leaders in the middle. And I'm going to interject as if we're having a conversation with the entire room. Well, a few more people are taking their seat. Um, Plaza de Armas. What does that translate into exactly? This is a test. This isn't part of the conversation. The weapons. Yeah, it's Weapons Square. It's weapon storehouse. Weapons Storehouse. <laughs> but what's beautiful about this gathering is that we've all brought our own lives in, our own arms, our own hands, our own thoughts, our own voices, and we're humanizing and uh, working towards the greater good. So the first uh, part of the next round is a comment. And so uh, our closing circle can comment on it as well. But with citizens of Jewish synagogues, Islamic mosques, Sikh temples, and Christian churches in this room, let's move beyond the language of separation of church and state. Let's say religions and state. Any thoughts about that comment? Okay. 
I think it's a lovely idea. I think we all understand that church means it is inclusive of the other religions. We're just not always aware we become the most religiously diverse country in the world. I, I think that, you know, when that term was first brought up, it was probably very appropriate to those who were making that term. But, um, but again, it's a matter of us waking up for something we so commonly say, right? To say that it's another day now. We are, um, and we do look different from people that just go to church. So I think it becomes a, an important piece um, as we progress together trying to be more inclusive. I think that comment opens up a conversation about the importance of language. In it's not a language. How about closer? I, the, the comment brings up an important space to, to talk about the importance of language and, and how we enter into dialogue with each other and also how we define, again, our public service. I think a commitment to always staying current with language that is inclusive of all different kinds of people is a practice that we have to continually dedicate ourselves to. And so while we might all understand that the history of why it's church um, rather than religion, there's so many other aspects I'm sure um, for all of us that we could afford to learn more and expand our vocabulary when it comes to language. Which really works, um, comments and connects to this next question of, you know, how can we work with, how can we open up a conversation with government officials whose religious ideas are the basis of policies and that can be harmful, like believing in science and environmental concerns. How do we open up that language? I don't know that I got the gist of the question, but I, I, I guess it was, how do you approach an official that's got strong religious beliefs in a certain way? Well, I don't know, but try to figure that out with Ted Cruz. Uh, I can't figure it out. Uh, I, I, um, I don't know how you bridge that kind of a gap. All I know, and religions are sacred, each one of them is, and you gotta stand up for each other. I know after the 911, there was an attack on Muslims here. Uh, somebody's restaurant was broken into and the windows were crashed. And we all had a conference at the front steps of City Hall with the mayor there and almost every religious leader, whether it was from the Jewish community or the Christian or Protestants or Catholic, were there to speak up for the Muslims. And I think that was really important. And we see some of that today with Trump's Keep the Muslims out, but let the Christians in. Anyway, we've got to stand up for each other. That reminds me of that day where, you know, you feel like things like that are so far away and what can we do? You know, we're, that's New York, here we are in San Antonio, and on that issue of hate that came out. Um, my son and I went up to the uh, Muslims who run the little uh, store up the street and just brought them flowers and said, you know, sorry for what you're going through. I think there's, you know, that thing that, you know, work locally, think globally, and, and we forget how local that can be sometimes and how important little actions can, can be, bridge some of those gaps. talking about those segregations, uh, about 1,500 veterans, they came to the mosque over there to support the Muslims. There was no place in that whole area to park any cars. Everyone wanted to know what's going on. And they were veterans. They were the people that served in the Middle East, most of them, that they know what was going on in the politics and when they served the army, what was going on. Just letting you know. And you think about that brave act as well. Um, and it, it turns to the next question, how do we try to overcome fear in faith communities to be more civically engaged without talking politics? And I would suggest the other side, it's also a valid question. How do we try to overcome fear in 
in the political realm to be more engaged with the faith community? How do we do that? We, we kind of talked about this in our group a little bit and because um, uh, we had one member of our group who was talking about uh, how the concerns when they, when one starts to try to discuss how to become engaged and specifically we did bring in like COPS Metro and, and I know what here very well. So <laughs> we've had lots of conversations. Um, and granted, I think the role COPS and Metro has played historically over the years has been a very important role. But I also would like to think, and I'm speaking for Jorge, that he would like not to be the only place, the only thing happening in town, right? That the hope is that there are other groups and other congregations and around the city that are doing exactly that. So the question was, certainly they have great tools and Calpus Metro has done great work, but how can we teach each other? And if it's not going through that door of let's say the Calpus Metro door, then we create another door, but that we look again at how we bring people, bring members of our faith community to think about um, serving the most vulnerable, vulnerable in our community. What is the humanity behind what we're trying to achieve for the common good? Can we all agree that we have the shared interest of making our community better? And then government plays a role in that. And how can we become more engaged in government at that level so that it's, it's all of us coming together to speak at city council or at commissioner's court? or to hold account, you know, other members accountable. And to be engaged, to be part of the solution, not just be account hold others accountable. How do we collectively hold ourselves accountable for these decisions? Uh, personally, I am a side of the learning. There's two terms, teaching and learning. I'm not at the side of the teaching. When you believe that to teach something to someone, then you close your mind to learn because your main goal what you believe is correct for you hold your life and you try to preach it and teach the people but I believe that we have to be at the side of the learning it doesn't matter what, what you do Either you are a teacher or a government officer but you have to be open to the learn another question how can we turn the negative perspective of politics and politicians to a positive one in America? Is that positive, possible? The basic word just simply means the work of the people. Boy, that's a, that's a, that's a tough one, isn't it? Well, first, to answer your question, I have to apologize because I'm not, I'm part of this problem when we talk about politics as being different from civics. Because we've, we've seeded the ground, we had a great conversation in our group about this, we've seeded the ground of vocabulary uh, to the folks that want to denigrate what happens in the political environment. Politics is very necessary for us to achieve compromise on any kind of issue, tough issue to find what the common ground is for a, a, a community of a diverse people. Uh, and you know, getting back to the, original, the, the earlier question also, there's any number of issues from environment to public health that is gonna require us to figure out how we bridge gaps between very different points of view. Politics is what gets us there. Um, this, this idea that politics being the art of compromise and that compromise and relativism is, is a sin needs to be done away with very quickly or we're never going to get anything done in our community and we see that that's kind of the gridlock that's happening you know in uh, state and national politics now but so we have to i think for me personally my takeaway is no longer talk about politics as being different from the work that i do or, or the kind of public service that i want to deliver bring it back into the tent of this is a very good thing for us if we behave well if we if we are uh, examples to our community about what politics can do. Well, what we're lacking today is civility uh, in the political spectrum. And 
particularly at the national level, of appealing to people's worst instincts. And those voices are heard a great deal more than, say, Kasich from Ohio, who has kept a very positive campaign and, uh, and overshadowed by, by all of the uh, rhetoric of, uh, of the two other major candidates. So it's missing, and I don't know how the faith-based community can teach a just a civic lesson in how to behave, <laughs> how, how that could infect politicians. But right now, uh, the rhetoric of the of the um, of the um, major candidate in the Republican Party is a, is garnering more votes than uh, civility is garnering. Seems to me too that whole Gandhian concept of be the change we wish to see, you know, to, to be these different, to use different language, to do that actively, to be about the work as well. I, I, I think also in the conversation that we're having where I'd like to differentiate between different registers of affect and change. It's the individual and there's also the institutional. And I think, Patty, your example of of walking to a nearby store and providing flowers that you know is, the store is run by a Muslim family. That's from the individual to the individual um, and that show of compassion. Um, I think when we think about affecting change or even building trust between public servants or politicians and communities, the individual there has a responsibility, for example, to vote. Um, to participate in those in our institutions in our local government um, and then from the institution side there's a responsibility as well to think about again using the voting example how can we ensure that everyone has access to vote um, and that that's an inclusive process which kind of ties into this one that uh, in the convening circle it was mentioned several times that it's important to include everyone at the table the question is where is the table Or what is the table? I think we sit at various tables every day of our lives or every week or throughout the year. And so um, where is a table? What is that? I don't know. I don't know how to answer that. Uh, but I, I, it's, 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 a, it's changing. Like we said, it's, it's, it's a mobile table. But I think it's just taking that time to pause if we are in a decision-making process or looking at, you know, I know I, at the at the university uh, where I work, we we try and see well, whenever we're looking to implement some kind of policy, even on campus, we say, what are students saying? You know, what do students think about this? And I think oftentimes, especially in higher education, that we don't do a very good job of including the voices of young people um, in the decision. Um, that is occurring, whether on campus or in our community. I think maybe one of the one of the challenges is that we're trying to define what the table is. Um, civic life, at least as I know it, should be inclusive of voices all of the time. And we can see that people aren't at the table when you know, we get less than 10% turnout in a municipal election, or when Pew studies tell us that Americans, uh, in greater numbers than ever before, find themselves non-religious or that don't affiliate with a, a faith of any kind, that means that they are not at the table. We're defining the problem. But I think until we, we, we stop saying, well, this is your table, you go sit at it when, we're, when you're called, uh, and not consider that the voices of civics and voices of faith and religious life should be present all of the time for everyone making decisions, um, we're not gonna really get to a solution and to push that into the next generation as well. Right, and, and, and so to follow on, you know, we talked about what's, so how do, you, how do you do that? How do you integrate other people? How do you integrate community voices and community opinions with your own when you're asked to make a decision? And part of that is just being a listener. I mean, the number one job for anybody to live in a community of any kind is to listen to your neighbors, make sure you're, you're conducting yourself in a way that's, uh, you know, Part of the community, um, but just to offer 
it to be open with any kind of media channel, any kind of opportunity to communicate with people in the community, especially when you're when you're in that kind of position. And since we're talking about how do we communicate with people in the community, what might be next from today? And I got a walking mic if others have thoughts. What might be the next step? Here's one. Susan? Susan? Follow up on the question of where is the table, and you know, I think that was a good answer. Um, uh, the table is everywhere, it's the amount of places, wherever you are in the decision making uh, uh, position, you are at the table. And a good question that came up, uh, good statement, is um, how do we uh, instill the language of uh, peacemaking among the leaders uh, at the table? That doesn't seem to uh, occur often, and I think it's a, you know maybe leaders today are perceived a certain way. They rise to the top with certain mindset, so they walk into the table uh, with preconceptions of teaching and doing, not learning and listening. So what's the, you know, he talked about the dichotomy of um, the dangerous dichotomy of two languages occurring, you know, in the spiritual life and the workplace, work-based life, you know, how do we reconcile those? Because there's a lot of energy, I think you mentioned, uh, in the workspace um, that is in entertainment that is almost dangerous. And it's, uh, how do we harness that energy into more of a peacemaking energy and I think the last statement was uh, the language of peacemaking is not for weaklings. Let's change that <laughs> attitude. So the question of what's next, part of it is how do we harness the energy and move forward? I think we had a, a statement over there. No? Yes? Okay, Alan. Ah, hello. Uh, yes, I'm sitting here thinking about a project I have working on right now from the University of Incarnate Word. It is called Interfaith Inc. Inclusive Celebration of Faith and Reason. And uh, I would love to send you the first draft of our mission state vision and plan and find from people like yourselves, in fact, find from yourselves, if we're heading in the right direction. And if you would like to put any additions or subtractions to what we are planning, it is will be held any place in the city. The table will be everywhere. But eventually, we will have a retreat and conference center, not for live-in retreats, but for a, a place like the Raindrop House, a place like that, or the university itself, where people can come and share their faith life not to evangelize, but to grow in understanding. And where it, it's directly, it will be situated north of the Denman Estate Park. When the Denman Estate was being sold to developers, one of the city council people used her power, and the people around the area used their power to connect with Diana Cyprian, who went to vote, went to back for them and the city purchased approximately 15 acres. Approximately seven and a half acres was left for development. And she went over to Lou Ignisi at UIW. He got the board to purchase it and said his dream was to have a retreat and conference center because walking into that space is like walking into the middle of uh, the hill country of Texas, right here in the middle of San Antonio. So it's a gorgeous spot. It's wonderful. It's, it's, it's country and it's still in the middle of the city. We have the space and the plans to build, but in the meanwhile, we need to build this. We need to build our relationships to support that. And we have now a woman who is teaching marketing at UIW 
and using her students to develop a marketing plan for the Interfaith Inc. And it is amazing what those young people are coming up with. You most likely will be having bumper stickers before we know it, you know. <laughs> Who knows? Websites, and I now own five or six domains. I never owned a domain. I didn't know what it was. Anyway, it's in my name. Poverty notwithstanding. Anyway, so if you would like information, I cannot promise that I will write to all of you, but if you would like information, take down this address. It's an email, a new email address, new to me. Interfaith Inc. That's I-N-T-E-R-F-A-I-T-H-I-N-C. But it doesn't mean incorporation. It means inclusive. Celebration. Huh? All one word. Just Interfaith Inc. at U-I-W-T-X dot E-D-U. I will have my student at UIW respond to you. He's not working until next Friday. Not Good Friday, but the next Friday or Saturday or something. Anyway, he is taking on the responsibility to respond for me. So what we've heard so far is harnessing the energy and the importance of knowing what's happening, communicating and connecting. And we got somebody coming here, but uh, Jonathan is also going to pass around the list of the folks in here. If you want to stay on an email list to hear more, if you would check, then you will be. If you don't check, you won't. So you had somebody, oh, Ali. Uh, just a real question, going back again to uh, how can we, what is going to be the outcome it could be of this meeting? And that is, uh, I have two suggestions. One is that all of us that we are, uh, we are involved in our faith communities uh, to initiate more learning uh, in regards to many of our uh, people that they are come to America, they're all immigrants. Okay, once upon a time we all, our ancestors were immigrants. They do not know how to merge and get involved into the politics of America. Uh, when they see what we see today in, in regards to the presidential elections will turn them out very badly because all of them they have come from the countries that voting and having you choosing someone has been a taboo even though that we cannot choose someone here either. Yeah, we are we're not democratic, we are more union. <laughs> so what I'm trying to say but still uh, my point is that uh, learning education of our communities in regards to not to be turned off from becoming a voting member and still be involved even if they do not want to get involved into the uh, national level but be involved in the local levels in the people that they choose that they really uh, make policies and the regulations in their daily life in their locality that's one thing that i'm suggesting that all we do when we go back to our interfaith i mean inner communities of our faith but then also suggestions to our part politicians with a positive gesture that you mentioned as the people who they want to serve their communities to connect to have dialogues to understand the communities that they are trying to serve and understand the, uh, the diversity which is existing so that they can serve them better thank you very much and i think we're going to close it at this point because uh, we said we would do that but to sum up to harness the energy to know what's going on in our larger community communicate and connect, to continue to learn and educate and go back to our own communities and open that up as well. I think those are all words of wisdom. If you have other specific ideas on how to do that, um, the Peace Center is welcome to hear that and we would welcome that as well. I just wanna take one moment before we go out into the world and back into our places. And I want to invite each of us to think of at least one other person in our life. Kind of expand this room a bit. Okay? That you've been having maybe a similar conversation with. Think about them. I also invite you to think about somebody else in your life that you find that it's more difficult to have this conversation with. 
and to think about them and encourage you to maybe reach out that way. And may they be blessed. May those who have brought us to this place, including our own family, our own communities, may they be blessed. May those directions that are harder for us to go and the people for us to engage, may they also be blessed because that's the only way this is gonna work. May the folks who made this happen today, may they be blessed and may our lives today all be blessed as we move forward into the world. Amen. I wanna also thank Sebastian um, when you're on your way out. Um, he kind of runs this place. So I wanna make sure that uh, we give him a thank you for the space, for setting it up, opening. Okay.